Taoiseach, uh, Judge Lefoy, uh, members of the Citizens' Convention Assembly. It's a great honour to be asked to speak here today at the opening of the Assembly. And at the outset, I want to wish you well in the very important and generous work you, you have undertaken. I remember, as a young lecturer in UCD, a group of distinguished and elderly male professors who used to meet in the common room every evening for a libation. They became known as the 530 Club, and their main purpose in life seemed to be to prevent change of any sort, uh, even the slightest change in the life of the university. And I can tell you, in those days, there were 530 clubs in every part of Ireland as people tried to prevent change. And I remember, too, a book, a very good book, published by a colleague of mine, Tom Garvin, uh, published about a decade ago. And it was about the Irish educational system in the early decades of the state. And in this book, he describes the so-called educational leaders of the time, but describes them as people who clung on to outdated views and outdated methods and to the great detriment of education over many decades. But the title of that book very aptly described what happened in so much of our country uh, during those years, and it's called Preventing the Future. And in some ways, these two examples reflect a pre prevailing attitude at different times in our history. The 1940s and 1950s in particular, where very little seemed to change, and not much seemed to happen. But much as pe such people might resist change, and there will always be people who do, and they're entitled to, but they ignore the reality that change is an ever-present part of the challenge of living. Sometimes we're prepared, and we even embrace it. Other times it catches us unawares, and when we are least prepared. But one way or other, change is inevitable. And sometimes we even have the opportunity to shape and influence it. This assembly is one such opportunity. You are called together to examine issues, both constitutional and major policy issues, issues which can profoundly influence the lives and the well-being, indeed the future, of virtually all our citizens. The issues you will examine, as the Taoiseach has pointed out, are important and they're complex. They certainly won't lend themselves to sound bites or glib evasions. Dealing with these issues will test you to the full. The great quality that you bring to this process is your freedom to be yourselves, beholden only to your reason and to your conscience. You are not answerable to a party whip. You are not enthralled to any interest group. You won't be running for re-election. You won't have to report back to any constituency. You don't have to hold press conferences or answer the electorate. And like Mrs. Theresa May and Brexit, you will not be asked to give a running commentary on what you are doing. You come here as free citizens. You bring with you your own life experience, your own sense of duty, your own values and insights, and you will use them to the best of your ability to examine the issues placed before you. And as the Taoiseach pointed out, you are not a substitute for the Oireachtas. You are here because the Oireachtas wants you here. And the, the Oireachtas has invested its consent in making this assembly happen. And as I say, you are not competing with it. You are not trying to supplement it. Your job, quite simply, is to be a breath of fresh air, to look clearly and honestly at problems not as a group with vested interests, but as an assembly of free citizens, to look at issues where usually the only voices heard are those of the vested interests, where the noise of conflicting claims drowns out all other views. Your job is to reflect the, the quiet views, the matter-of-fact views, the ordinary views that don't find their way onto the airwaves or into the media, and to do so in a measured way that will carry weight. Most politicians will welcome good advice and new insights. And if you do your job as well as your predecessors in the last convention did, your words will be invested with a moral authority that will not be easily resisted. Now, I was asked to say a few words today about social change in Ireland. 
and it's not going to be easy over the five or so minutes I have left. And what I'm going to look at is to just make the point that as a country, we have had to face up to some huge challenges over our hundred years of history. There, and in balance, I think our country, I would say that we got most of the big challenges, faced most of them and got them, most of them right. We, we didn't always do it. There are many missed opportunities, many times when we could have and should have done better. There are times when we stubbornly resisted change, either through inertia, which was an Irish failure for many years, or through being worn down by the defenders of the status quo, who saw all change as dangerous, or at least dangerous as far as their vested interests are concerned. When we look back at our 100 years, almost 100 years of independence, we can say probably that the, see that probably the biggest challenge we ever faced was the first one, the ability and the capacity of the new state to assert its sovereignty by setting up a state, by creating new institutions, and by forging a distinct new national identity. But most of all was the battle to establish its own authority and win the trust of its people. And if you just think for a second at the challenges faced by that small group of largely inexperienced young men who made up that first government, we can see today the enormity of what they achieved. They had to fight a civil war, a war that was bitter and divisive, that left a lasting and poisonous legacy. They had to f face up to repairing, firstly, the entire infrastructure of the state, the roads, the railways, the public buildings, buildings like the GPO and the Four Courts, all of which had been destroyed during the years of conflict. They had to do all of this, rebuild the state, without any outside help. Today, a new state will receive a great deal of international aid. When our state was established, we didn't get a penny of help, either from Britain or any other country. We had to do it all on our own, raising our own, own resources. We had to accept that government had to accept the reality of partition, which was a huge blow, especially to the nationalists of Northern Ireland. They had to do other things, demobilise an army, bring it under civilian control, set up an unarmed police force. And what will be of particular interest to you over the coming weeks, they had to uh, establish, they had to draw up and have accepted a new constitution, our first constitution, one of the two we've had. And it's worth looking back on it because it was a good constitution which recognised human rights and seen as a time, seen at its time as being one of the most advanced constitutions in the world. And this is very relevant to your deliberations. It favoured easy access to referendum. It had a view of direct democracy, that the people should be consulted as often and in as straightforward a way as possible. So it proposed that there would be a referendum where 100,000 people could sign a petition and then this would be, would be voted on. It didn't ever happen for reasons which you'll, discuss, uh, you'll discover if you go into it, but it's an idea that's worth looking at during the course of your deliberations. But this new government wanted the new state to be outward looking. And in spite of strong British opposition, it brought Ireland into the League of Nations into the International Labour Organization, all within years of independence. And so they established Ireland as a state that wanted to be part and play a role in the outside world. And it did other things as well, and I won't go into them here, like setting up the ESB, first nationalized industry in the world. But all of that was done by the first generation of free Irish men and women in less than a decade. Just 10 years, nine years, the, the enormity of the achievement, even today, is astounding. And within 10 years of the state being set up, and just nine years after the Civil War ended, power was handed over peacefully by those who won the Civil War to those who had fought against the state just 10 years earlier. The Irish state had come of age. Now, it's important to stress this, because sometimes when we look at the problems we face today, it's important to put in context how, in a way, soluble and small they are compared to the enormous problems which our forefathers had to face uh, on all our behalves at the founding of the state. But if the first great challenge of independence was to establish the state on firm foundations, 
The second great challenge was the very survival of the state as Europe and the world tore itself apart in the Second World War. We were a small, virtually defenceless uh, country, and yet, with good leadership and the backing of a united people and with all political parties working in common purpose, we survived as an independent state with our people safe and our neutrality intact. We paid a heavy price and it took decades to recover, but we did survive. Third great challenge which we faced in, in more recent times was of course, biggest challenge is independence, was the willingness of the Irish people to take a leap into the unknown by voting to join the European Economic Community in 1972. For the first time in our history, we could play a part in rebuilding Europe. We, we would have a much less dependent relationship on Britain. We would open ourselves up to new ways of doing things. But most important of all, we could share in the benefits of economic development, something we hadn't done well at up to then. But few today would regret that decision and little that we have seen, I think, in Britain over the past couple of months would encourage us to do so. And the fourth great challenge which we faced as a people, as a state, was, of course, the economic collapse of 2008 onwards. Part of it may have been our own fault and we were not prepared. We had grown maybe complacent, maybe overconfident. But we could have faced devastation for a decade or more. And we should all remember a sense of prevailing pessimism which affected us and all of us during that period. Yet our political system and our political leaders showed a unity of purpose. Our people were patient and resilient and we came through, damaged, yes, but intact and positioned to recover. And it's important to remind ourselves when we look back now on how we did come through that crisis, that nothing was inevitable. There was no inevitability that we would come through the crisis or not be maimed for decades to come. But we did make it happen. As with our neutrality, as with the foundation of the state, our leaders and our people made it happen. Now, of course, we've had our failures, uh, but I won't dwell on them now. There's quite a few of them. I could go right down through them, uh, but I, time is catching me up on that. So. I'm just making the point we must never be complacent. We have to realise the huge opportunities we missed for economic development, the failure to our immigrants, the failure to those who ended up in institutions who became virtual non-people in this country. All of these failures we must keep in mind. We must always be determined that we would never make these mistakes again. But as you set out, out about your work, I urge you to take inspiration and encouragement from the things we achieved, when we worked together as a people, when we put our minds to achieving agreed objectives. I ask you to take encouragement from the enormous achievements of the present generation of younger Irish people, both here and around the world. They are showing our potential for achievement in almost every sphere of human activity. These people are our future and our hope. Your work is not to pamper the prejudices of older people like myself, but to look at the changes we should and can make to build on the generous and noble principles both our previous constitutions enshrined. They are good and solid principles and a great basis and a great philosophy to influence your work. Your job is to examine and enrich all of this, this in, the changed, in the changed world we inhabit. It is a job well worth doing. But may I say to you also, and speaking to other people who were in the earlier uh, convention, it's an experience which will enrich you. You should enjoy it. You will make new friends. You will get new insights. And most of all, you will, if you do your job right, and I know you will, you will make an enormous public contribution. I wish you well. Thank you.